come and discover Portugal with us. Please like, subscribe and leave your comment. Your support and opinions are very important to us. Thank you. The village of Castro Laburair is located on the northeast slope of the Peneda Mountains, which has its highest peak in Alto do Giastoso at 4,380 feet. It is located on a mountainous plateau known as Laburair Mountains. Dry bushes are abundant in this area, where animal species such as hares proliferate, originating the medieval toponym Monte do Laburairo, Mounts of the Hare, which gave rise to the name by which this region is known. The vegetation in this area includes heather, gorse, broom and nardo strica, which serve as food for raising sheep, goats and bovine cattle. The Laboreiro River and its tributaries provide the water necessary for human communities to settle. Agro-pastoral activity has been at the center of the lives of the inhabitants of this region since time immemorial, having shaped a nomadic way of life that is unique on a national scale. The village of Castro Laboreiro stands at the epicenter for a group of dozens of small population clusters known as Brandas, located at higher altitudes, and Invernaires, located at lower elevations. During the winter, the populations moved before Christmas from the Brandas to the Invernaires, the transhumans that not only involve their livestock but all their goods and belongings. This migration, motivated by the extreme severity of the cold season in the mountains, led people and animals to the valleys, where they were more sheltered and where they could guarantee their survival. The houses in the Invernaires were smaller, freeing space for the cultivation of rye, potatoes and, more rarely, maize. These communities were centered around the community oven, a place for producing bread and a warm shelter in winter. In March, the same populations returned to the Brandes before Easter in search of fresh pasture for their cattle, brought by spring and after the progressive melting of the snow. The Brandes are located at the confluence of the two main roads that give access to the plateau, to where the cattle were taken to graze freely, returning to the stables at the end of the day. This transhumans thus accompanied the change of seasons, and simultaneously the Christian religious calendar, which, in essence, only came to sacralize the moments in which these seasonal movements had occurred for millennia. In the central square of Castro Laboreiro is the pillory, a reminder of the time when this town was the county seat. The original was built in 1560 and was dismantled in 1860 to allow the construction of a house. Its parts were dispersed across various places in the village. In the 1980s, Father Aníbal Rodríguez promoted the recovery of some of its pieces and the possible reconstruction in its current location. Its column is based on a pyramidal frustum base which, on one side, has carved horizontal grooves that would be used to measure the skeins of linen. Nearby is the Castro Laboreiro Parish Church, dedicated to the visitation of Holy Mary. Its construction dates to the Middle Ages, possibly in the 12th century, and was later renovated in the 16th and 17th centuries. On the side facades, the buttresses that support the arches of the central nave are visible. In the southwest corner of the temple stands a circular sundial. The main facade has a straight-framed portal and a bell tower attached to the left side. It features, at its top, a hexafoil, a symbol of protection that dates back at least to the Bronze Age. It is topped by a small, four-lobed oculus and a niche in a round arch containing an image of the patron saint of this church. The interior has a single nave, divided into six sections by a set of five round diaphragm arches, between which the wooden ceilings can be seen. 
On the Gospel side, there is a cylindrical baptismal font made in the 16th century, whose basin has, on the outside, a frieze decorated with stylized fleur-de-lis in bas-relief. The chancel, completely redesigned in 1755, is narrower than the nave, featuring a polychrome carved altarpiece in white, beige, blue and gold in the neoclassical style. It is lit by two windows and has a curved wooden ceiling. This church underwent rehabilitation work in 2015, with the north side gallery being adapted to house a museum space where various pieces of sacred art can be seen. On the northeast side of the town stands the so-called Old Bridge of Castro Labrero, a pedestrian crossing over the Labrero River that essentially served the nearby mills. Its construction took place after the 16th century, being entirely made of granite masonry, with a humped span over a single round arch. The floor is paved and does not have protective railing. In the granite outcrops on which this bridge is built, we can see some giant castles, rounded depressions in the beds of some rivers that are caused by the rotating movement of pebbles and sand driven by the water. The Castro Loboredo Plateau presents traces of a lasting human presence, at least since the Neolithic period, as confirmed by the plethora of archaeological remains found here. In total, more than 60 megalithic monuments have been identified to date, representing one of the largest concentrations of structures of this nature in the entire Iberian Peninsula. Located at elevations above 3,200 feet in altitude, we can see tumuli, dolmens and rocky outcrops decorated with rock engravings, a memory of the ancient sacralization of this impressive landscape. On the Castro Lobrero Plateau there are also important traces of the Roman presence, namely the largest and oldest camp ever found in the current Portuguese territory. On top of a hill, located southeast of the village, 3,390 feet high, is the Castro Loboredo Castle. The occupation of this place dates back to the 6th century BC, still during the Castro culture period. Local legends say that it was originally built by the Moors. The first documentary reference appears in the cartulary of the monastery of Selanova, which, in the 10th century, attributes these lands by inheritance to Saint Rudisend, grandson of Hermenegildo Gutierrez. The construction of the castle took place from the year 955 onwards on the initiative of Saint Rudisend, who was appointed governor of the Val de Limia by King Ordoño III of Leon. Later, in 1140, Afonso Henriques, future King Afonso I of Portugal, conquered the town of Laboreiro from the Leoneses, ordering the repair of its defences in 1145. The castle thus became part of the borderline of defence of Portugal's domains in its extreme north in a project that would be completed during the reign of Sancho I of Portugal. In 1212, the castle was raised during an invasion of this region by troops from the Kingdom of Leon. King Afonso III of Portugal would later elevate Loboreiro to the statute of village through a charter issued in Lisbon on January 15, 1271, granting the privilege of not recruiting soldiers here. The town was part of the county of Bercelles until 1834, being a commandery of the Order of Christ since 1319. Around 1290, King Denis of Portugal promoted the reconstruction of the castle when it assumed its current plan. The castle has an oval and elongated plan, adapting to the very irregular, steep and rocky terrain where it stands, being oriented on a north-south axis. Its architecture is Romanesque, featuring Gothic elements present in the integration of flanking towers and small turrets in the walls of the fortress. It is divided into two core areas. 
The one on the north side, located on a higher plane, was part of the military center of the fortification, with the keep, now missing and having a geodesic landmark on the rock where it stood, in the center of the place of arms and the cistern. It had two doors. The main one, facing east, was called Sun Gate, and the Betrayal Gate, also known as Toad Gate, located to the north, in a round arch. The nucleus on the south side, located on a lower level, constituted a secondary enclosure, separated by a wall oriented in an east-west direction. It was accessible through a semicircular arch portal. The primitive function of this area was to collect livestock and goods in the event of a threat, making it a unique space in Portuguese military architecture, revealing the importance of pastoral activity in this region. In the wall on the southeast side there are two doors, one of which currently gives access to the path that leads to the castle from the south, which is longer and less steep than the path facing north. The construction of the wall of the southern enclosure of the castle incorporated a spring and a curious natural cave, which may have served, over the centuries, as a shelter for shepherds and animals during storms. Here we can also see incisions made in the rocks, memories of the extraction of granite blocks used most likely in the construction of this fortification. The stonemasons carved rectangular cavities in a line where blocks of dry wood were fitted, which, after being soaked with water, expanded, generating a long fracture and the separation of the stone block. The mayorship of Lobureiro and Melgas were united at the beginning of the 14th century, being entrusted to the Gomes de Abreu family from Muruf. King Ferdinand I of Portugal would later donate it in 1375 to Estevão Anjos Marinho, in whose possession it remained for a short time. During the reign of Manuel I of Portugal, the castle was drawn by Duarte de Armas in his Book of Fortresses, dated 1509. In this representation, it is possible to observe the walls, reinforced by five quadrangular towers. In the center, we can see the keep, also with a quadrangular plan, preceded by another structure, with the cistern appearing on the north side. The village is represented on the lower plain. King Manuel I granted a new charter on November 20, 1513, when the town officially became known as Castro Laboreiro. It should be noted that the word Castro generally designates a fortified settlement. In 1643, during the Restoration War, the castle received a garrison, being the place from where the Portuguese forces departed two years later to devastate the Spanish countryside to the north, looting some villages. The castle was beset by a tragic moment on November 18, 1659, when lightning struck the keep, which served as a gunpowder store, completely destroying it as well as the wall that surrounded it and the chapel located nearby. In May 1666, General Baltazar de Rojas y Pantoja managed to conquer the castle by surprise after just four hours of battle, having appointed Pedro Esteves Ricards as its military governor. The latter would end up surrendering without resistance to the governor of arms of the province of between Douro and Minho, Francisco de Souza, third count of Prado, being accused of having sold himself to Portuguese interests. After the end of this conflict, King Afonso VI of Portugal decided to preserve the castles of La Pella and Castro Laboreiro, despite the negative opinion given by French military engineer Michel de l'Ecole. Castro Laboreiro Castle would be unguarded following the signing of the Treaty of Utrecht in 1715, which put an end to the War of the Spanish Succession that had been going on since 1701.
In 1758, in a description containing that year's parish memoirs, the castle is described as very old and with the governor's and soldiers' dwellings all ruined and without doors, as well as part of its walls. At the beginning of the 19th century, in the context of the Peninsula War, it was garrisoned and equipped with four artillery pieces, but was then unmanned again with return of peace, which would worsen its abandonment. In 1944 it was classified as a national monument, by which time it was already deeply ruined. During the 1970s, archaeological surveys were carried out here, which collected pieces from the High Middle Ages. The Municipal Council of Melgas, in whose municipality Castro Labrador has been integrated since the second half of the 19th century, promoted works to enhance and improve access to this castle, which is integrated into the Peneda Jerez National Park area. Thank you for discovering Portugal with us. If you like the video, please click on the like button and subscribe to the channel to follow our new releases.